Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. Before we begin with the main developments, we note at the beginning of the video that multiple Western media outlets are reporting, citing unnamed sources, that Russian leader Vladimir Putin will travel to China in October for the Belt and Road Forum at the invitation of Xi Jinping himself. If accurate, this will of course have several implications, including in China's relations with the EU, and we will follow the development in more detail as those details are made available. Putin Putin hasn't left Russia since the International Criminal Court in The Hague announced a warrant for his arrest in March. We remember that he skipped the BRICS summit in South Africa last week after the government there said that they would comply with the order to arrest him as a signatory to the ICC if he wants to land in the country. Okay, now let's move into the video. And first up, we have a few salient developments related to U.S.-China relations to move through. U.S. Commerce Secretary Raimondo is winding up her four-day trip to China today, the fourth senior U.S. official to travel to the PRC in recent months. On Monday, Raimondo met with her counterpart in Beijing. After her meeting with the Minister of Commerce, the two sides announced working groups and information exchanges. Then yesterday, Tuesday, Raimondo met Met with Premier Li Qiang and Vice Premier He Lifeng, according to Chinese state media. In the meeting, Raimondo expressed, "Quote: The Biden administration supports China's economic development and improvements of people's livelihood, and has no intention of containing China's development, and does not seek to decouple from China." End quote. At a press event. After the meeting, Raimondo made slightly similar, though more nuanced, statements, including, quote, "The U.S.-China commercial relationship is one of the most globally consequential, and managing that relationship responsibly is critical to both our nations and, indeed, to the whole world. And while we will never, of course, compromise in protecting our national security, I want to be clear that we do not seek to decouple." Or hold China's economy back. End quote. On Tuesday, Raimondo also met with China's Minister of Culture and Tourism. The two ministers agreed that the countries would host a gathering in China early next year to promote the travel industry. Some of Raimondo's statements during this trip are worth noting too. On Sunday, she met with the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. Then, while traveling from Shanghai to Beijing on a high-speed train, Raimondo told reporters, "Quote." Increasingly, I hear from businesses that China is uninvestable because it's become too risky. There are the traditional concerns that they have become accustomed to dealing with, and then there's a whole new set of concerns, the sum total of which is making China feel too risky for them to invest. End quote. In a separate comment to reporters in Beijing, Raimondo said that she had raised the matter of controls placed on American company Micron, arguing that unlike U.S. export restrictions. China's actions were not transparent. Quote, "There's been no rationale given around what's happened to Micron. What there's no place for is arbitrary rules, lack of due process, lack of clarity, lack of rule of law. That's an unlevel playing field, and we're going to stand up to them when they do that." End quote. Meanwhile, in the South China Sea, U.S.-China relations are not going quite as swimmingly either. On Sunday, the commander of the U.S. Navy's Seventh Fleet said in the Philippines that the PRC's quote aggressive behavior end quote in the South China Sea should be challenged. Vice Admiral Carl Thomas told his Philippines hosts that they had the U.S.'s support in the region, saying quote My forces are out here for a reason. End quote. State media was not very happy with the comments. With state-run Global Times writing this week, quote, "Thomas's remarks prove that the U.S. hopes to heat up this event again to continue provoking China-Philippine relations, with the aim of Manila fully aligning with Washington and becoming a front runner in the U.S.'s strategic plan against China." End quote. Adding, quote, "The current tensions in the South China Sea are mainly caused by the U.S.'s instigation." And such action of playing with fire is dangerous to the U.S. 
End quote. Beijing is also not happy about a meeting between the U.S. and Indonesian defense ministers, where the U.S. readout of the exchange includes that they, quote, shared the view that the People's Republic of China's expansive maritime claims in the South China Sea are inconsistent with international law. End quote. A PRC foreign ministry spokesperson said that the U.S. had misrepresented Indonesia's view on the South China Sea. Interestingly, this language did not appear in the Indonesian readout, though Jakarta hasn't expressed a rejection of the American language either. Jakarta is likely trying to walk a diplomatic tightrope, as it will soon host the East Asia Leaders Summit. Also, tomorrow, Thursday, begins two weeks of defense drills initiated by the U.S. and Indonesia and involving 19 nations, including Australia, Japan, Singapore, and the U.K. Now, while we're here, we note, too, that the White House has confirmed that U.S. President Joe Biden will be traveling to Vietnam on the 10th of September, and it is likely that the South China Sea will also be discussed in that meeting. Next up... The Chinese economy. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to hit that like button. Sharing this episode with someone who you think would enjoy this sort of content is also a huge help. And for the 50% of regular viewers who are not subscribed to the channel, if you do like this sort of content, maybe consider subscribing, hit the bell notifications, and you'll have these episodes as soon as they're released. And for anyone who wants to help keep the channel financially sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everybody for the ongoing support. Next up, the Chinese economy, and we look at the housing crisis, where we have several salient developments that we need to cover. In yet another attempt by Beijing policymakers to revive the sick housing market, the People's Bank of China has signaled that mortgage rate cuts will be coming. We remember that the central bank and the national banking sector have been in a tug of war over this question for months now. The former hoping to stimulate housing demand, the latter concerned about already shrinking profit margins on its biggest asset class, that is, mortgages. It remains unclear what impact reduced mortgage payments will have on consumer spending and demand, however. UK-based Reuters writes, citing unnamed sources, that some Chinese state-owned banks will soon lower interest rates on existing mortgages. The reduction could be as much as 20 basis points in some cases. The outlet writes that lowering existing mortgage rates is expected to further weigh on the banking sector's net interest margins, NIM, a key gauge of profitability which fell to a record low already at the end of the second quarter. U.S.-based Bloomberg writes that the big state-owned lenders, the big three, are reducing rates on the majority of the nation's 38.6 trillion yuan, 5.3 trillion U.S. dollars, of outstanding mortgages, and that, quote, the moves are part of a targeted push by Beijing to spur consumer spending, drive more funds into the stock market, and alleviate pressure on lenders' profit margins. End quote. That's the demand side. Now let's look at the equally concerning supply side. It appears that news about the massive private developer Country Garden gets worse by the day. We remember that the market has been watching the company closely, with some fearing that its collapse would be worse for the wider sector than the initial Evergrande default. Quote, if no external force comes to its rescue and Country Garden falls apart, other private property developers will collapse one by one, and the last bit of market confidence will be worn away. End quote. The Guangdong-based developer, which was China's top developer in terms of sales for six consecutive years, starting in 2017, is facing imminent payments in September for three bonds. Quote, in the second half of 2022, Country Garden had trouble repaying loans. Local governments intervened to arrange loan extensions with banks, but new lending has remained limited. The share of bonds in Country Garden's total liability is not big, but if a public default starts, the risk will proliferate to all debts, impacting the interests of the entire industry chain and home buyers, and further eroding market confidence. End quote. It is estimated that Country Garden has almost one million units across the country that are unfinished. Meanwhile, other developers are very much on death's door. On Monday, Evergrande's shares fell as much as 87% 
after trading in the Chinese property developer's stock resumed for the first time in almost a year and a half, and the company delayed crucial restructuring meetings with creditors. The company is now involved in more than 2,000 lawsuits involving over half a trillion yuan. Finally for today, Chinese financial media outlet The Economic Observer published an interesting piece this week arguing that authorities should end all controls on cutting real estate prices. That is to say, to remove the measures used to impose a price floor on real estate and that such a move is actually currently under debate in Beijing. If such a move was made, it would be quite an incredible development. Quote, I wonder what would happen if local governments start getting rid of rules limiting price drops in home sales. PRC real estate is not a real market, as there are distortions layered upon distortions. The odds are decent that declaring prices for homes in some cities could be 50% or more lower than what they appear to be which, if true and realized, could set off a whole chain of financial and stability issues. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Wednesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.